What's up, everybody? It's Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief for Front Office Sports. We're back with another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. I appreciate everyone who's been tuning in, listening so far. Uh, It's been really exciting to see some of the feedback, and I want to continue to have some great conversations on here. So with that said, today we're speaking to Christian Ponder, former NFL quarterback. He was drafted 12th overall by the Minnesota Vikings, where he played for a few years uh, then he bounced around to a couple other teams, Denver Broncos, San Francisco 49ers. Grew up in Texas, so you know knows all about football in terms of the pressure that comes with that, the expectations that comes with that from a very young age. And then he was able to reach the pinnacle in the sense of making it to the league, which only so many people do in the first place. But Christian will be the first to tell you he has his regrets. He has his things from many years ago that he's stuck on where he feels like he could have played better. He could have worked a little harder. But from speaking with him for close to an hour, I get the sense that Christian really does have an incredible work ethic. And even if you know NFL did not pan out the exact way that he would have liked or he would have anticipated, he learned a lot from that. He learned a lot. He built some relationships. And now he's out here with this company, The Post, which is sort of like a Soho house for athletes. Uh, they just raised a few million from Will Ventures and Andres and Horowitz, and they're launching in September based out of New York City, looking to open a club in New York City next year. And we talked about that. We talked about hobbies like fly fishing, his family, um, other NFL quarterbacks who he has a relationship with and was able to get a little bit of advice from. Really great conversation, really great guy. Uh, I'm not going to hold us any longer. Let's go ahead and get into it. And thanks for tuning in to the My Other Passion podcast. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. And if you sink it, the championship is yours. But you don't. On the backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. You can't see anything. Sound familiar? Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is number one cloud financial system. It's going to give you a full picture of your business with that type of visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and much more. You're really going to get everything you need in one place. You can automate manual processes. You can close your books faster than you ever have. And all of this is going to help you stay well, well ahead of your competition. In fact, 93% of surveyed businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 31,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and this summer, not too much time left, but you should get moving now because NetSuite has a special financing program for those who are ready to upgrade. That's at netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. One more time, head over there. You can get this special one-of-a-kind financing offer. Remember, this is the number one financial system for growing businesses. It could very well change your entire business. NetSuite.com slash my other passion. Get over there, check it out, and see how you take your business to the next level. Christian Ponder, how you doing today? Welcome to the My Other Passion Podcast. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, Ernest. Thanks for having me on. We were talking a little bit before uh, we hit record, and I know you're in New York City right now, running around. Uh, how's that going for you? It's going. It's going. It's uh, it keeps me busy. I think uh, you know my my wife was fortunate enough to put in some time in in Manhattan before we ever got married when she moved up here straight out of out of high school and, and started pursuing uh, her her sports uh, journalist career. And and so I I got a little taste of it. I was excited to uh, to move here after I was done playing, and I figured um, you know. For me to figure out what was next, New York seemed like a pretty good spot to go do that, and and it's been great raising raising three kids here. I know we talked about before. I, I grew up in Texas, and you know my family who's still in Texas is, has a hard time imagining you know me living in New York or let alone raising kids here. But uh, but it's been great. Yeah, I was um, I was living in New York for a long time before I made my way out to California, and I think people kind of like overhyped they're like how could you raise kids in Manhattan it's a great place to to raise kids I was I was in like the Yorkville area with my wife and kids and um, I thought it was great yeah and we're we're on the Upper West Side which I think is similar vibe to to Yorkville which is on the Upper East Side and uh, very it's it's not Times Square I think when people like think about oh you're raising kids in New York City they immediately picture Times Square and I I avoid 
Times Square, like it's the plague, which is, I don't know if that's a good term to use now since we're actually well, in Well, a... true. Um, <laughs> in a but pandemic. It sounds, but... If you're already avoiding Times Square, then it sounds like you're on your way to, you know, real New Yorker status. I know. For sure. Yeah. I know the definitely. natives might not agree with that since you're just a little bit of time in. But I'd say yeah. like after, after 10 years, you know, I felt like a New Yorker. I wasn't born and raised. I'm from Chicago, but... You know, I I grew to know the city very well, uh, and you know, I might even be back one day. But and I, I, know, I know, yeah, uh-huh. I, I was to say I know there's some hurdle, right? I think is it is it ten years? Someone says you have to put in so many so many years before you actually can say you're a New Yorker. So I this will be our we moved moved up here in August to seventeen, um, so this will be coming right up on five years. So so maybe we're we're halfway there, um, but I don't know. So I'm, maybe I'm a, a halfway New Yorker. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, no, the time, that time flies by too. I was thinking about 2017 the other day, just, you know, you might, you might see um, something on social that's like five years ago today, this happened. And you're like, what? Yeah, that was yeah. five years ago. Um, but sure. I know a big part of New York City is, you know, your post NFL career. And it's obviously a great place to be for business. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the NFL a little bit, but let's start with where you're at now and like what New York City does for your life from a business perspective yeah. and everything you've been trying to accomplish since you retired back in 2016. Yeah. And that was, you know, the business side of New York was the biggest draw uh, and, and attraction for me to move here and figure out what, what I wanted to do next. When I was at Florida State, I I got my MBA, uh, and so I was excited to pursue that that next chapter once sport was over. And and I, you know, in the NFL, I had the, the chance to keep playing after my last year in San Francisco in, in 2016. Had a few options, but again, I was excited to to start my business career. And we already had one kid, and our second was on the way. And it just seemed like the right time to, to hang up the cleats and uh, pursue something in, in the boardroom. And um, and so when I moved to New York City, start pursuing or, or going down the path of wealth management. Um, started pursuing my CFA and uh, in the meantime, got introduced to, to entrepreneurship and venture capital. And um, as I was pursuing these these things of business um, and with, you know, these these pretty aspir- you know big aspirations, uh, I, I felt this like deep discontentment around being an athlete, you know, walking away from from sport. And you know, I've been a part of sport had been a part of my life for for so long. I mean, really, since I was since early childhood and. I'd always been an athlete. It's always been part of, of who I was and, and deeply ingrained in, in my identity. And and not only that, but it was the community I was a part of. It was my tribe. And and so as I started looking at things to to belong to in New York City and I joined Soho House, I looked at things like YPO or Core Club, uh, which are some of these more professional business communities. And um, I just, it didn't feel like it was for me. And I looked at the athlete space and didn't really see anything there. And so I felt um, the need or at least the desire to build something that was for me. And so I I launched what's called the post or which we'll be launching in in September here in New York city. But um, basically it's, it's just a business community for athletes. And you think if you look at a YPO, if you know what YPO is young price authorization, it's a, it's a business community for, for younger professionals. Um, and then if you look at a Soho house, which is a private membership club for people in the creative arts starting in, in London and has been tremendously successful, um, the post is kind of the intersection of those two. How do we give athletes uh, a place to belong when the doors of the locker room close, but not only give them a place to belong, how do we give them the resources, um, and the team to push themselves to, to pursue greatness and whatever they're pursuing when, when the, their playing days are over, because, you know, what we fully believe that about athletes is kind of anti what society season athletes right that society sees athletes as hey you peaked um when when your playing days were were up and now it's all downhill and um we believe in the opposite right like we're we're the antithesis to i am more than an athlete um because we think being an athlete is a tremendous asset right you you were trained to be successful and and having a tremendous work ethic having this tre- tremendous competitiveness and um the grittiness the goal setting the the always intrinsically or introspectively looking how can i get better at whatever i'm pursuing specific to sport like that's who we want to be a part of the post and, and to go crush it in life and in uh, life after sport so how will the post work essentially i understand that you know the business model will likely be centered around membership uh and subscription of sorts yep. but 
you know, knowing the space and FOS, we're covering this every day. Athletes are increasingly getting you know better and more involved in business, and it seems like everything's disparate a little bit. Like yeah. you know, this person's working with this venture capital fund. This person's working with this company. This person started something over here. This person started something over there, and so. When I read about the post, uh, I think it's a great idea, and I understand the mission statement. I understand where you're coming from, uh, but I wonder with everything like so disjointed in a way, or it seems like you know there's not necessarily that community aspect, even as people are growing. How do you convince people to say, "Well, let's make the post a center ground. Let's make yeah. the post, um, you know, something that we can all work from," versus people who are used to saying, "Well." you know, let me figure out my thing. Let me work with my partners. Like, you know, how do you, how do you become that for people? Yeah, I think it, it starts with the, the community aspect, right? I think um, we have been a part of teams and in locker rooms our, our whole lives, basically. And, and suddenly you, you walk away from the locker room. And when you talk to so many athletes about uh, what do you miss most about playing, 95% of the time, the answer is going to be, I miss the locker room, which is just another word for community, right? And so, what we want to build is is we want to remake that that locker room in kind of a different form. Uh, you know, when we were in the locker room, when we were on teams, that whole kind of ecosystem was built to unlock athletic potential, right? You had your teammates that held you accountable and, and were your support group. You had your coaches that pushed you to get better. You had your training, your playbooks that, again, were there to make you better. And, and so how do we recreate that same type of ecosystem for the same type of people where I walk into the, the doorways of the post and I immediately get that locker room feel. This is, you know, these are athletes. These are my people who I, I know best, who I connect with best, who are there to support me um, and not only support me, but push me to be better. And, and hopefully we become the central hub of all things business for for former athletes. And and I think how we start too, it's not a lot of people, I think immediately think about athletes who are transitioning out of sport. I think what we want to build first is those athletes, something for those athletes that have already transitioned well. So the, the leaders in business, who are there because they were built by sport, but they're already tremendously successful in what they're doing today and give them what they're missing. Those people that are missing the locker room, we're going to give them the locker room, uh, that place to be and, and, and belong to. And then again, um, utilize to, to make ourselves better in every form. So what do you think is, you know, in your mind, you're launching in September. Um, I believe I saw 2023, like you're opening like a proper club in New York city. Yeah. Um, your dream scenario, what does someone get out of this? Um, is it walking in and, you know, seeing someone who they wind up you know, doing a deal with? Is it um, simply just like moral support? Like, like what, why should an athlete sign up for the post? Like specifically, I understand there's community. I understand this space is going to be a great place, but like when you just look at it on like a hard ROI, here's what I get out of it. What do you want? people to walk away with yeah it's look it's it's all performance based right it's just like sport right when we played sport it was all in the merit of performance um and and same thing in business and so we hope that when someone walks into the post and 10 years from now they look back on their the last 10 years of of their business and even their personal lives um they really see the support group that they have within the post and then the 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 resources um when it comes to continued learning or or leadership development um, or the, the, you know, the, the workshops that we plan on doing when it comes to pro- professional development, um, that they got better, right? This is about accelerating pathways to, to positions of leadership or for those people that are already in, in positions of leadership. We want people to, to perform better and, and keep those positions longer. And, uh, and, and we hope that the reason is that, the, you know, that they, as they look introspectively, like it was because of the post. It was because, again, I had this tremendous support group. I had this group that I only not only we're supported by a belong to, but push me to be better because we know like as, as athletes, right? We know when we have individual pursuits, like we can put our work in and get better um, on an individual basis. But really when we belong to a team, I think that's when we are at our best. Cool. So the post is a focus for you from a business standpoint uh, itself, but a lot of the work that you're trying to you know, prop up and facilitate through the post is just people with different investments and different ventures and out of side of the post itself, what has that part of the game been like for you? Like in your post NFL career, like 
what have you invested in types of companies that you're interested in uh what you've learned about being an athlete being a former nfl quarterback who is coming in and trying to say hey like take me really seriously as a businessman um before you got to the post and really focused on that as your business, what have you seen around the world of just investing and in, uh, business overall? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think I, I stated my lane of things that I was most interested in or, or knew best. And I think uh, that's where who, your athletes who have been successful, I think that's where their focus should be. And so I, I primarily invested in consumer goods because uh, that, that was attractive to me and, and so I invested in companies like uh, 10,000, which is uh, a men's ath- ath- athletic wear company that's done tremendously well. Um, a company called Porter Road, which was an online butcher shop that um, you know has done really well. And, and even this was pre-COVID, but um, you know it was companies that really, I, I first of all, I liked their products. Second of all, I had conversations with founders, um, really saw the, the hunger and the drive, right? Like uh, a lot of people, even the, the, the founder of 10,000 was a former collegiate athlete. And, uh, and so you can get the sense of, of his competitiveness and his ambitions. You could, I, I just, in those conversations, I could feel like the hunger for these founders that, um, they were going to do whatever, whatever they could to be successful. And, um, I invested in another company that was, um, was trying to disrupt like, uh, pain medication. I, I, it was, uh, basically how they deliver it and, and the type of pain medicine they're using. They're still, um, kind of. Uh, in stealth mode, developing, spending a lot of time in R and D and and uh, pursuing um, clearance uh, to to put their product out there. But um, things again that that resonated with me, things that I were interested in. Um, I, I've definitely cooled off on the investment side, and you know now I'm I'm solely focused on the post and building that out. Or we do hope that again our our belief in what athletes can be post post sports career. Um, at some point, we do ha- love to have a, a, an internal fund where we invest in athlete-led businesses, founded businesses, and um, almost have this entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, or, or incubator within the post. Because again, I think um, athletes are, are really well-suited to, to be successful, especially as entrepreneurs. And uh, to me, there was so much crossover between entrepreneurship and, and being a professional or collegiate athlete. And, uh, and, and we want to put our money where our mouth is and invest in those companies. So that makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering how did your playing days inform the way that you look at life now? It seems like your passion and your focus is in business, is in the post. Um, but obviously a lot of people know you from the Minnesota Vikings. They know you for being the 12th overall pick. You know, maybe some even go back to your Florida State days. Um, but I think, you know, you're an interesting person to look at and understand. I grew up in Texas. Uh, There's this precedent in my family to be extremely serious about football. I go, I achieve this dream. I make it to the league. I get drafted fairly early. I come in, I'm at Minnesota, uh, play for a few other teams throughout my career. And I think, you know, you famously have your highs and lows. Um, How do you sit with that now? Um, Is it the type of thing where – you totally move on. It was cool. I made it to the NFL. I made some good money. Or do you have regrets? Do you have things that you can't get over and you get stuck on? Um, why don't we address that first? And then I'd love to understand, yeah. like, how does that help you with business? How does that, you know, change your perspective on the things that you're doing now? Uh, I, I would say when I look back on my on my football career and whether it was collegially or, or, or professionally, and my wife gives me a hard time for this because I'm often very critical of myself. And I think, I think that's how most um, athletes who kind of reach the pinnacle of sport are. I think um, I, I obviously there were some definitely some, some high times where a lot of great mem- memories on the positive side, but I, I definitely spend more time uh, awake at night thinking about the mistakes that were made or uh, the, the regrets I had, uh, you know, a bad interception or, uh, you know, a bad game or not preparing hard enough for, for this specific time in my life or, whatever it was, um, you know, I, 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 I look back and I think the thing I would change is maybe not caring as much about what other people thought. I think, you know, there was definitely a stigma or a, a framing around me being the 12th overall pick that I was overdrafted. And, um, and I cared too much about that. People thought I was overdrafted and, and put way too much pressure on myself and, and really had an impact on my confidence. And when you're a quarterback in the NFL, I think confidence is probably the the most important aspect of, of playing that position. And so when you're not confident, 
then um, then you're going to be behind the eight ball. And, and, and I dealt with that my whole NFL career. Uh, probably even dealt with that a little bit in my collegiate career. But um, but I, I, you know, I, I learned a lot. I, I'm very thankful for my, my time in the NFL. If I could do it all over again, I, I would. And I would obviously change some things about how I, I approached those specific topics. But um, but I, I, you know, I, I learned a lot. I, I learned that, um, you know, especially as, as I take this into my business career, that um, I, I think athletes have this belief that they can make an impact on on outcomes by by their work ethic. I think we were trained to to uh, w- whatever work you put in, um, then then you kind of reap what you sowed, and and I think that translates translates a lot to business that um, we can control to a certain extent outcomes when we put in the work and work harder than, than everyone else because that's that's what we're taught every day in practice, every day in the locker room, you know, in season, off season, it's all about the effort that you put in, and I think that translates a lot to to when your your cleats are hung up and and uh and your your sporting days are over so what's one of those interceptions or one of those moments that keeps you up at night i say this because like i can i can relate even there's things and i see this i think everyone's like this because i'll see memes about it on tiktok and stuff where all of a sudden you'll be like washing the dishes or you'll just be on a walk and you're like, I can't believe I said that like nine years ago, you know, to just <laughs> pop into your head yeah. and, and it's real. And I can only imagine what it's like when you're on like a world stage, like being an NFL quarterback. Um, yeah. And so what's something that, you know, if you could just be vulnerable for a second, you know, yeah. really sticks with you. And I'd also like to talk about the things where it's like, yo, I did that. I'm really proud of that. Outside of just making the league, do you have a game or a play that you're like, yeah, no, nah, I was a, a bad dude even for that, you know, that little, <laughs> that little slice. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like what are the things that really specifically you, you get stuck on and, and what's some stuff that yeah. you're proud of? Uh, I, I think, well, it's two things that stand out on, on the, the negative side. I think um, – the first one, going back to college, I, I my junior year in college, I, I played really well at Florida State and, and probably would have declared for the draft early had I not got injured. But um, I can't remember if it was like the ninth game of the year. We're, we're playing at Clemson, a big primetime game on Saturday night. And um, I broke my ribs the, the game before. I can't remember um, who we were playing the, the week before, but uh, broke, broke my ribs. And um, so I didn't practice all week and was uncertain about where I was going to play. And it was kind of a last minute decision that, that I was, I was going to play. And, um, you know, went, went through the whole, uh, pain management process to get ready for the game right before the game happened and, um, end up throwing, you know, start the game pretty well, but then throw three picks. And on the third pick, which I think was towards the end of the end of the game, um, I was basically the, the last one, last man standing to stop a pick six on, um, Deandre McDaniel was a, a big safety out of Clemson. And, um, and I just remember in slow mo, like he's running down the sideline. I'm pursuing him, and I'm honestly I'm just pissed off, and I just want to hit him as hard as I can, which is not smart for a quarterback. And so, of course, I I try to blow him up. He's probably 235 pounds, and um, leave with my shoulder, my throwing shoulder, and I hit him. He he goes down, but he's probably laughing because it's like it's nothing to him. And I'm like I'm laying on the ground, like I'm like something doesn't feel right. And I can't really lift my shoulder. And so I stand up, I go to the sidelines and um, I, I tell the trainer like, Hey, so, something's weird with my shoulder. And uh, he's like, all right, we'll check it out. And so he like, he sticks his hand under my shoulder pads and is feeling around. He's like, all right, like we need to go to the locker room immediately. And, uh, and so we, I'm like, okay. So we go to the locker room. He, he takes the, another trainer goes in with me, the assistant trainer. And he take, he helps me take my shoulder pads off and he immediately cringes and looked down at like my collarbones, like sticking, you know, three inches up <laughs> out of, out of my AC joint. And, uh, and so I, you know, that was my end of my junior year. I, I ended up staying at Florida State for my senior year, but I just never felt like I, I threw the football the same. And, uh, and so again, it, it was another con- contributor to like, just not being as confident. So I wasn't as confident my senior year. And then going to the NFL and, and again, you know, combining that with being the 12th overall pick and me having these, these internal doubts about whether I deserved that or whether I was as good of a player as I was, you know, then than as I was my, my junior year before injury, because honestly, I mean, when I, when I threw the ball, when I was, especially my junior year, I just, I felt like I couldn't miss. I mean, I was, I was really confident and I was, I think at my, my, my peak performance and, and then, you know, going into my rookie year, uh, it was the lockout year in the NFL and, um, 
and we ended up signing. So we didn't know when training camp was going to start, if it was going to start time. I think it was like a few days before training camp, they get the CBA done. You know, Minnesota signed Don McNabb to kind of be the veteran quarterback in Minnesota before I took over. And um, and so I think Donovan started six games and uh, I go in for cleanup duty because we were getting beat pretty good at Chicago on a, on a, I think it was a Sunday night game and I played pretty well. And, and so they, they made a decision to start me that next game. And um, immediately we, we played the defending Super Bowl champions, Green Bay Packers. Uh, I had a, a, a decent game. I think I threw two interceptions, maybe both to Charles Woodson and uh, we lost, but I, I, it, I played well enough that I was like, okay, I can do this. I felt pretty confident about it. We go to Carolina, beat Cam Newton at Carolina for my, my second start. Um, and then at some point I, I remember my, my second memory about like the regrets I had. I remember we, we played Detroit um, at Detroit and I had a horrific game. I, I can't remember. Like I just made really dumb decisions and, uh, and I got pulled actually sometime, I think in the, in the second half and they put Joe Webb in and Joe Webb actually played tremendously well and almost led us to a comeback. But um, and then I think that's when the doubts really start sinking in. I think that kind of confirmed what people had thought about, oh, he was overrated uh, he, or he, he was overdrafted, he was picked too early. And, uh, and and then I think, you know, some of that, again, could driven more doubts. My, the rest of my rookie year was terrible. My second year was was okay. I started well, had a lull in the middle of the season, ended up making playoffs. Um, and then, you know, again, going to the third year, I put way too much pressure on myself to, oh, this is a big contract year and just played with – with too much pressure and and couldn't deal with it and then obviously that that was the end of my kind of career in minnesota and then bounced around after that and um so it's you know i, I definitely had some great moments in the nfl some moments i'm proud of what, what's one of those like what's one that at least with some of the regrets you look back and you're like damn i had a game like that in the nfl i had a moment like that in the nfl and that sticks with me as a moment of pride yeah i mean look i especially my second year was definitely my, my best year we made the playoffs obviously it helps when adrian peterson hall of fame running back uh or, or soon to be hall of fame running back um was uh you know almost set the set the record for for most rushing yards in the season he had a he had an unbelievable year but uh you know we i remember we beat jacksonville jaguars so we've got the ball with 13 seconds left we're down um uh, by three and uh you know, we, they, they kick it off cause they just scored a tie it. And, and in 13 seconds, I think, you know, we started the ball on the 20, uh, in 13 seconds, we got in field goal range, kick a field goal to go in overtime and then, and then won that game in overtime. So that was, that was big for me. I, I remember I had a big, you know, 30 yard completion on an end cut that probably shouldn't have been, been able to complete and, and was able to do that. So that was, that was a great game. Um, I think probably I the how best you game. Remember all the details, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Every minute oh, detail. Yeah. Well, and then I remember. I mean, probably my favorite game was we beat Green Bay, uh, week seventeen, my second year to make it into the playoffs. Um, you know, it was you know Aaron peak performance of Aaron. I mean, he was obviously playing really well at that time, and obviously still is playing really well. Um, but uh, we we beat them. I threw three touchdowns. Uh, you know, had a big completion. Uh, in the fourth quarter on a third long to Michael Jenkins on the sideline um, that we knew kind of schematically how they played it, that we'd have a chance. We drew this play specifically for that and, and uh, made that completion, put us in field goal range, kicked the field goal to win the game and, and end up going to playoffs. But um, you know, that, that was a great game that I was proud of. I mean, there were definitely times where I, I felt like I had it in me to have a long NFL career. And there are other times where, again, I just, I wasn't as confident. I was dealing with some injuries and, and uh, and and I think that just impacted. And then look, I mean, when you go through the grind of the NFL, it's it's you, you really have to to love the game to deal with, um, you know, the the injuries to deal with some of the negativity and the adversity they have to deal with. And and uh, I got to the point where I could have kept doing it, but I chose that uh, I, I was ready for the next chapter. Yeah. So when you're in that next chapter, uh, you have your family. You're you've been married. Uh, children, you have the post, you have a new thing that you can focus on. Um, why and how does one, I guess, get stuck in the past a little bit? I'm almost asking this as if there's any advice you can apply for me personally, for uh, for other people who, who might just be like, man, I'm really trying to move forward. I mean, seems like you are a great example of someone who's who's dealt with that. And you know, I'm I'm curious how someone who's had 
the success, even if, you know, your playing days didn't totally pan out, you know, how you wanted. Um, you reach this place that a lot of people strive for their whole life. They don't make it there. And I just wonder how you move forward and like find peace with that and how it played out and then make the post the best thing that you can make it. Yeah. I, I look, I'm, I'm 34 years old. I've, I haven't lived that much life, right? I'm not really not a, an advice giver. And, um, and I, I think too, I think all of us need to be kind of be uh, skeptical in some of the advice that we receive from certain people. But um, look, I specific to my life, I, I, I don't know if I ever put in the work to like move on. I, I definitely did some introspection on, um, you know, some self-assessment when I left football and was figuring out what I want to do next. Right. I think um, I did some, some work there and, and talked to some people, talked to my wife and who's and my wife has been such a tremendous um, positive impact on, on my life. But um, I think maybe one of the biggest things that she really opened my eyes to was, you know, I think a lot of, if I look back on my life, I think, um, and it's still something I'm working on. I still, I still have a lot to work on. Trust me. Um, that, uh, you know, insecurity is probably one of the things that, that I dealt with a lot in my life. Grew up as a shy kid and, um, you know, and maybe that that's not the right word. I think the word was better described as insecure. And, and, and what I thought was me dealing with these um, abnormal insecurities were really, it's just a part of life. I think a part of humanity is we're all united in our own insecurities and fears. And, and, uh, and I think what I did a bad job was is I, I, I didn't see other people as insecure. I thought I was the only one. And I think when you level the playing field with everyone and, and realize that no matter how successful someone is, or even some of the people that are most successful, really that success was driven by an extreme insecurity. And I think that to, to me, that's been so eye-opening to walk into a room um, with no matter who's in that room of, of being able to, to humble myself out of my own security, but also connect with them or realize that no one um, is, is beyond uh, having a conversation with or, or, or being uncomfortable around. I just, I think we're all, kind of on the same level playing field. We're all trying to figure it out. I think we're all looking for advice from someone. And, and, uh, I think we're all a little bit, uh, we're all a little bit screwed up in our own ways. And, and, uh, but I think as long as we, again, going back to that effort piece, as long as we put in some work to get better, um, at those insecurities or get better at whatever we're working on and we have the support system around us, then, uh, I think it'll, it'll go a long way for everyone. Absolutely. So what is it like to achieve a dream in general, um, I think a lot of people are are fascinated by kind of the um, the separation between the dream and the reality. And I see this across film. Oh, I finally I've been auditioning for years and I finally got a movie role. But here's something I didn't anticipate or music. I finally got that record deal. I finally got a hit single. Uh, but this is what I have to deal with. And same goes for sports. And um, I'm wondering, how did it feel for you? to achieve that dream, to say I'm at the league? Like, what was it like uh, getting drafted and going back home and, and you know, telling your family and them seeing it on TV? Obviously, you grew up in a football family. Um, what was that like? And then, you know, what is it that people need to realize about the moment? A lot, Like, a lot of people, I think, don't realize or start to realize is that that dream moment is actually the beginning, right? For sure. And that's, um, yes. 100%. And so, yeah, what was your experience, um, you know, with that? I guess, you know, I, yeah. I wonder about, like, the pride that comes with it and some of the, like, harsh realities. Yeah, well, and, and you, you nailed it on the head, right? Like, getting drafted, especially in the first round, I think so many people see that as achievement or as, like, a goal. And really it is. It's the starting point. Uh, I think what some people think of a, a, as a pinnacle, it's like, no, now actually the, the work – actually begins like it actually gets much harder from here because a long career in the NFL requires a tremendous amount of, of work to, to, you know, in the, in the in season, off season dealing with adversity, right? Like it's, it's gotta be a constant pursuit in, in order to, to maintain a, a career um, that's six, seven, eight, ten 10 plus, you know, years. I think uh, what the average NFL career is 3.6 years pensions at four. So um, you could do the math about why that is, but um you know, it is odd, I think, uh, to have dreams achieved at age, you know, 22, 23, 24 years old. And, and I think for some people, it's like, you know, that question is always like, well, now what, you know, like, especially 
when you get to the end of the NFL, you get drafted and even say you have a long NFL career. And um, it's always like, now, now what? Like my dreams were achieved. Like my purpose um, has, has happened. And, and I think that's where a lot of athletes do get in trouble too, is, um, you know, I think especially in, in specific to football, uh, football is such a big part of this country and growing up in Texas is a big part of, again, who, who we are. And, and it's almost like football is the end itself and everything else is a means to that end. And, and I think a lot of us get ourselves in trouble when that's the case, because what happens when the end itself ends, right? And now I don't have another end. And so um, to flip that on its head and realize like, no, football is a means to a different end. Um, what, whatever, whatever that means to you, whether it's providing for my family or for my, you know, for my parents, my kids, um, providing for the next generation of youth or my charity or um, whatever it is, like I, I, you know, that football cannot be your purpose. It's, it's got to be um, means to to a different end, and and I think that that alleviates some of that transitional stuff. But um, but it is it is weird when when it when it when it happens and ends very quickly at an early age. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting in, in sport because again, football is so big, right? Like it, the NFL draft is primetime television and, right. and, and so many people, it's, I think it's gotten even more popular in the last few years. Um, and, and again, has, so I people, believe the ratings are up. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's turned into a spectacle now. And, and, uh, I mean, I remember watching it as a kid, but now that they've kind of moved it outside of New York and moved it around and, you know, 600, 900,000 people are attending in person. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy the attention that it's gotten. Yeah, totally. It's, it's crazy because the NFL has been such a big, um, just important part of America culturally for such a long time. And it's yeah. only getting bigger. Like this latest round of media deals, 113 billion over the next decade. Uh, incredible. Uh, you know, there, I think there's a talk that Apple is likely going to come in, uh, for Sunday ticket, it's just like we're yeah. in a new world. We're streaming. Media is different. They're opening up uh, the type of people they're allowing to to advertise with them. And sure. I feel like the 2020s is gonna is gonna be quite a ride for the NFL. But well, yeah. You know. And this, look, it's the rise of fantasy football, and not only now, not just fantasy football, but sports gambling is only gonna make you know fans even more engaged and have have viewership continue to go up. And it's funny because. When I played, I hated fantasy football, right? Because it created this weird dynamic between fan and athlete, right? There was almost, uh, you know, a fan now didn't care only about the outcome of the game, but also cared more about individual performance because I had you on my fantasy team. Uh, I even had a player one time, my rookie year, who was on my team, who mentioned to me because I had a bad game, he was like, "Hey, bro, like I started you on my fantasy team this year, like, what? Or this this week, like, why why did you play like that?" It's like, wait, you cared more about the outcome for the fantasy game than the actual game. Um, but now on the flip side of it, being a, a fan now and playing fantasy football, um, it does obviously. Now I watch games I would never watch because I have someone on my fantasy team. And so, uh, and now throw in the, the sports gambling side of this, it's just, um, it's only going to keep going up for, for those NFL teams and, and viewership. Yeah. What's it like? You, you talked about kind of the disillusionment that comes with, achieving a dream at a very young age and then you know having it in quickly and having to look at the now what but in that time in between I think one of the allures of professional sports and when people look at a situation like yours or or many others um, undeniable part of it is the money the compensation you know we can look publicly on the internet and say oh Christian Ponder made this many millions, you know, in his mid twenties. Um, what is the reality of that? Like, was it despite how things were going on the field, it was just like, wow, like I'm a millionaire. I could buy this. I could buy that. Um, did you feel like it was nice, uh, but you, you didn't really, it didn't really mean much to you if you were down about, you know, how something went during a game, like, you know, people are always wondering what's it like to be a millionaire that young? Um, and then how do you manage it? Like, how do you keep yourself humble? How do you, you know, keep yourself yeah. from blowing it all? Did you, did you have to learn cause you spent a bunch of money and then had to get with your financial advisor or were you always low key? Like, what was your story there? Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I, look, I, I grew up, my, my dad, uh, you know, he was, he was always the guy that was on, like, you know, kept every receipt and every track of every, every penny that we spent. And so, 
definitely instilled on, on me financial literacy and the importance of saving and not spending a lot. And, you know, I, I did buy, um, I, I bought a car was kind of my, my big purchase after I got drafted. And, uh, but it's what amazing. Car? It's, I bought a Porsche Panamera, which, you know, driving around in the snow in Minnesota didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but look, it's funny because I, I do think people think about that, you know, whether it has to be with an athlete or a founder, or, you know, you read about billionaires or whatever, but like, look, human beings have this amazing way to always be discontent, no matter what we have. Right. Like that first time I, I got like a, an endorsement check for $1,200 going to my bank account, uh, as I was, I was, I was getting ready for the draft. Um, I remember like, wow, I have way more, like way more money than I ever had in my bank account. Like I'm so wealthy at $1,200. And that was even before I got drafted and everything. But like immediately, it's just like you start focusing on what I don't have, or I got to focus on, look, I want to sign a big contract. And we're, we do a horrible job of ever being content with the things that we actually have. And, um, and so, you know, fortunately now, like we've, uh, you know, my, especially my wife has been so successful that, that that's helped. And, um, it's actually helped me to kind of be in, put my, my entrepreneurial hat on because I'm not making a lot of money doing this right now. Um, and, and she's definitely given, given me the flexibility to, to pursue that, but, um, you know, did relatively, or, or obviously did extraordinarily well, um, to, to the average American and, and just really blessed to, to be in the position that, that I am in and, uh, and it's given me the flexibility to pursue what I've wanted to pursue post post sport. Nice. Is there any sort of camaraderie among, uh like NFL quarterbacks, like, you know, I, I wonder you, you came in after Favre, um, you know, you were right in the middle of, I know you talked about like beating green Bay and that was like Rogers had just won the super bowl. And obviously you have Tom Brady who was relevant then he's still playing now. Uh, you have guys like Aikman who are now like the biggest, you know, broadcasters in, in the world and in the sport. Um, do you have any, you know, times where you ran into some of them and it was just like a quarterback to quarterback type of conversation? Um, you know, you all are uniquely among all sports, like such a focus of how everything goes. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if it's just like, okay, cool. We all know we're quarterbacks. We do your thing. Or if there's like, you know, any phone calls, any, any meetups that, you know, made yeah. you just part of this club of like elite and rare athletes. Yeah. Well, uh, look, you definitely, and, and obviously I'm, I'm nowhere on the tier of a, of a Troy Aikman or an Aaron Rodgers or Tom, but, um, you know, we definitely, would you see guys and, and you often, it's not uncommon to run into to guys that, you know, but I, we actually just spent, uh, in the first half of summer, we were out in Colorado for a week, um, doing a, we did a, family dude ranch camp thing out in Colorado. Um, and it was, it was all basically all quarterbacks. It was, you know, myself, Ryan Tannehill, Ben Roethlisberger, Carson Palmer, Drew Stanton, Andy Dalton, Case Keenum, um, Colt McCoy. I think that was, that was it. And it was, you know, we were all there together. And so I, I think that is a, it's a unique bond. It's, it's, you know, we're bonded by an experience that not many people have shared and, um, and, and we did that same group. We did the same thing last year. So that was the second time we've done it and, um, already plans to do it again next year, but, um, a time to, you know, it's an interesting mix. Cause obviously, you know, a lot of that group is still playing, but a lot of that group is done playing. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a good time for again, community and camaraderie and connecting and, uh, whether it's talking about football or it's talking about, you know, whatever parenting or marriage or fly fishing or, uh, w- whatever it is, it's just, you know, there's, there's so much shared commonality within that group that it's easily easy, easy to connect and feel like you belong to something. What's something that sticks out as like a part of those conversations or something that you really walk away from a gathering like that and say, damn, that gave me a new perspective or just something that quarterbacks share among each other when they see and talk to each other that like people might not realize I'm trying to get the inside because you know you're an NFL quarterback there's only so many of you all like yeah. in the history of the world and when you all all get in the same place together I, I imagine something happens uh some conversation I, about football is it competitive yeah. like like what happens look I think when you get a bunch of 
you know, ultra competitors in a room, it's always gonna be competitive, but like, you know, competitive for, for guys that are mostly retired, it's like playing cornhole or knockout on basketball court. Right. It's like, it's a whole different level of competition. Um, I don't know if I walk away from those conversations with like massive insights. I, I think it's just, um, you know, although we're all, you know, whatever quarterbacks that played in the NFL, like we're still like dealing with real world issues, whether it's, you know, figuring out how to be a better dad or, um, you know, w- whatever it is, are we making the right decisions as a family or, you know, with our finances or our interests or whatever our time spent, like it, it was just good. You know, this you know, idea of like iron sharpening iron, like, you know, bringing people together. It's almost like a reset of like, Hey, like let's, let's refocus here. Let's reshape um, kind of what we're focused on, what we're pursuing. And, you know, again, going back to that purpose issue or, or purpose idea, like, are we making football the purpose? Or are we making something, you know, much, much greater than football itself, uh, our, our purpose and how can we, you know, better engage that, that, uh, that, that higher sense of purpose and, and pursuit. And um, I think it's just a good time to, to come together and enjoy some great conversation and, and walk out of there feeling a little bit refreshed. How's, how's Ben feeling headed into retirement? Yeah, I, I, I got no insider information there. I think he's, he seems like he's in a good place. I mean, I, I met his three kids at this camp. He's got a tremendous family. It seems like he's doing really well, um, you know, as, as a father. And I think that's kind of his going to be his, his focus from, from now on. I mean, uh, it's, it's definitely going to keep him busy, but, um, he seems like he's doing, he's doing really well. He seems like he's at, at peace with everything. And I, I don't see him making some, uh, tremendous, you know, headline story about making a, making a comeback. It seems like he's doing really well. Cool. What's this, um, fly fishing part of your story? I mean, you literally have it in your bio. <laughs> you just, you oh. just mentioned it. Um, some you've been doing a long time, something it's, that no. is how you, how you find tranquility. Um, uh, and your post NFL career, what's up? I think probably just one time I just saw how good look like Brad Pitt looked on like a river runs through it, you know. Like I, I don't. I grew up bass fishing with my grandfather in Florida, and I think uh, you know fly fishing was one of those things that was like on TV, but it was like not reachable for me. I grew up in Texas. There's not really any fly fishing in Texas, and you know we weren't the family that you know we were a, a middle you know income family. It's not like we were going to go pursue fly fishing. It seemed like it was just so far out of reach. Um, but I always had this dream to do it. And so actually it was my, my wife, Samantha, that took me on a trip to Montana the first summer after we got married and, um, uh, got, got to go fly fishing for the first time. And I, I fell in love with it. I think it's, you know, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's a great escape, even though my, it's just like my, my wife, she's funny. Cause whether it's golf or fly fishing, like, because the competitor in me, like I want to catch fish, I want to perform well. I want to, you know, I want to break 80 in, on the golf course or like, or let's be honest, I want to break a hundred on the golf course. Like I, so I, you know, she's like, you just spent four hours on the golf course, but you come home mad. And it's like, well, yeah. Cause like I, I could have done better or, um, or I like, you know, I, I lost too many flies or I un- had to untangle too many knots while I was fishing. But, um, but I think to be out, you know, in nature and, and usually where you're fly fishing, it's somewhere beautiful in the mountains, you know, on a stream being in the water, I think. Um, and it requires some skill, you know, like, again, growing up bass fishing where you're throwing a big old spinner bait, like, you know, f- to me, fly fishing is more of an art form and, and, uh, and, uh, it's definitely one of, one of my passions, but, um, you know, one day, hopefully I'll teach it to my kids and, and we'll take my kids, uh, with me when I do it and we can connect that way. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been fun. So bringing it back to the post, um, it's been really interesting to learn about all these different, you know, aspects of your life and career, um, you know, you have, you have a lot that you've been through now that you're focused on the post, which we talked about a lot in the beginning. Um, how, how does all of this, everything that you've learned, um, you know, inform where you're headed and where you're going next? I, I understand, you know, the concept of the post and, and you all just dropped a release like last month about the launch and everything we can expect going forward. it. Um, but, you know, personally, when you're running around New York City and you're trying to trying to make things happen and trying to get this done, um, you know, where do you feel like you're headed? Where do you feel like this ultimately is is going to lead to? Um, you want that community of athletes, but you know, do you, do you think that it's something that you can really have, you know, a long-term impact on how people view their, their post-playing careers? Um, yeah. you know, or like, like yeah. what, what do you want to get done? Do you think this is like something that's around for decades and, 
you know what's what's so. the what's the plan yeah look i i hope when when people think about what athletes do when sport is over and, and you know they no longer think about you know the the 30 for 30 on espn broke right like where oh all these athletes who you know i think the statistic in the nfl is 70 percent of athletes are broke or divorced within two years of retirement and um we want to flip that narrative right i i think uh again i don't i don't want to be using slogans like i'm more than an athlete anymore right like because that that the framing around being an athlete is is so tremendously negative you know i don't say i'm more than a doctor i'm more than a lawyer i'm more than a teacher it only for some reason applies to athletes and and honestly it pisses me off a little bit um because when you look at look people who've played at least collegiate sports make up less than three percent of the u.s population but they account for 52 percent of women in the c-suite today they account for uh, 15 of the last 21 U.S. presidents. They account for uh, a majority of Fortune 500 CEOs in 2015. And so that's a tremendous outperformance against the regular population who happen to not be collegiate athletes. And and I think what sets them apart is, this again, this tremendous work ethic, this competitiveness, this drive, this commitment, this being able to work on a team. And, and, uh, and so I hope that the post is around for a really long time. And I hope that it just becomes the place that as I – transition away from my playing days i'm not leaving sport behind i'm just now part of the post and that's just a continuation of my sports career because um it's, it's a continuation of who i am as an athlete and the community that i'm a part of and maybe i'm no longer playing a, a sport that involves a ball and and you know on a field but now i'm playing a sport that we call business right and again like i said before like sport still requires you know performance it still requires a work ethic it still requires the ability to to work good on teams, work well on teams, you know, you know, putting in a work ethic to, uh, uh, to improve on whatever you need to prove upon, right? Like it's sport. It's just, it's just not the same form that we played when we were kids. So are you mad at like LeBron and Mav Carter and, and no. Co for pushing the more than athlete? I, no, 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 no. Because look, I, I, that's, that comes from a good heart. That's not like, it's like, obviously they don't view athletes as negative. Um, you know, and so I, 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 I'm not slamming on them. Like I know that comes from a good place. I, I maybe I should say I, I'm more pissed off by the shut up and dribble stuff, right? Like, um, because like I, I just. But if I could change one thing, it would be getting rid of these slogans like more than an athlete or or um, athlete and whatever it is. Because like ath- being an athlete is not only good enough, but it's actually more than good enough because. You know, maybe we not we haven't been trained to be computer engineers or or whatever it is, but we we have the foundation to be successful because we've already been successful. Um, it's just again, just just on the field, but but we have those those building blocks, that foundation to be successful, whatever we pursue. Oh, so so getting out of here, um, all of this said, what is your personal legacy? I know so much of this sounds selfless. It's about you know, helping people and the next generation and how athletes are viewed going forward. But like personally, especially when you've been so honest and real with me about, you know, being critical of yourself and your personal shortcomings and regrets about how things went in the league. um, You know, do you have an investment in saying, all right, like Christian Ponder, here is what people think. I don't want them to think about, you know, these few years that were difficult in the league or like, do you even get caught up in that? But I, you know, I think it's, I think it's something that a lot of people who are on like a national stage and a global stage, like you are very conscious of, you know, we can Google you and see a million different things. Um, And what do you want that to be? You know, what do you want your name to go down as like the guy who played in Minnesota a few years and did his thing or like, you know, uh, who, who is Christian Ponder when it's all said and done? Yeah. Look, I honestly, I haven't thought about kind of a, a, a bigger picture legacy. I, I don't know if, you know, I know on like the daily, like the, the, the things that we pursue on a, on a minute by minute daily basis contributes to our legacy. Um, but look, I, I the, when I think about legacy, I more think about the impact that I have, you know, on, on my children, and my, my wife, and I hope that, that that's really a continu- continuation of, of who I am and who I've been. But uh, if on a, on a broader scale, whether it's the people I'm around or the people I'm in relationship with or through the post, look, I, I really hope it's, it's about authenticity. You know, I think we're in this era right now f- through social media and, and, and whatever else that kind of we're really living in authentic lives. 
um, or, or we're not transparent. I think w- what I try to do is, is be more authentic. I, 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 my wife would, would, uh, cast some doubt there on, on some things that I'm not authentic about with, with, you know, in, in all areas. And I'll say, again, I can, there's always room for improvement, but, um, look, I think it's all about authenticity. I think that, again, like if there's an athlete looking for ways to improve, the only way we can prove is if we're, we're honest about where we're at and authentic with, with who we are. And, 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 and I hope that, that in a space like the post, we can have athletes who are more authentic and talk about who, what they're struggling with or, or what they're pursuing or what their interests are. And, and we want to help that. But I, I do, I, I think, um, you know, there's, for me, there's been a call to like, drop the mask, drop the charade, let's be authentic. And, and that's where real life is, right? That's where the beauty of life is in, in our authenticity, in our, in our brokenness, in our insecurities, because that's what unites us. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you for keeping it so real with me today. Um, you know, fascinating life and career. I think there's some that <laughs> all of us can l- learn from And I know you might laugh at that, but truly there are lessons in, you know, everything that we talked about today. And I think that's because you value authenticity because you came and kept it real with me and said, you know, here's, here's things that I learned from here's regrets that I had. Here's how I'm working on being a better man today after everything that I've been through. And no matter what, that's something that's going to be relevant, um, you know, for all of us. So I appreciate you being so candid during this, cool. you know, this whole conversation. Well, I appreciate you, Ernest, for giving me some some time to uh, to talk through some of this stuff, and and I appreciate, man, you're you're great asking questions. So this was uh, this was a fun conversation for me. Great. Right. Well, uh, keep an eye out for what you're doing with the post next time in New York City, which is actually um, not too long from now. Uh, maybe I'll pop by. You know, yeah. I pl- I played in high school. I played basketball. You know, I played Pop Warner football. So maybe I can we'll, get my. We'll let you in, bro. We'll we'll come, swing by. I, I know somebody that can that can uh, let you in the door. So we'll we'll definitely have you come by. For sure. All right, cool. Thanks, Christian. We'll make that happen. I right, appreciate it, Ernest. All right, that's a wrap on another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and listening. It's been a great ride so far. I'm looking forward to where we're gonna take this. Shout out Christian for coming on, being super vulnerable, keeping it super real with us about the highs and the lows of the NFL and the years after. Shout out my producer, Daniel Myrick, who's been grinding on these episodes. Uh, And I would love to hear from all of you. Like I say, always hit me up, Twitter at Ernest Baker, email Ernest at FOS.company. I welcome any feedback, any suggestions. And shoot, if you want to jump on the show yourself or you know somebody who would be a good fit for it, Let me know. We're just getting started here. So much more to look forward to. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and we'll be back next Wednesday. Take care.